Professor Wolf, welcome. Thank you very much, Tom. Glad to have you with us. Uh, first of all, capitalism hits the fan, the global economic meltdown. You did not write this as a consequence of this uh, deal that was just worked out over the weekend. Uh, you wrote this book as, as a, uh, looking at a much larger uh, uh, economic situation. Uh, give us the largest frame. Well, I wrote the book, and we were relatively early in the so-called economic crisis that started in the autumn of 2007. But to be real honest, I have to tell you that uh, I did not expect things to spin as far down as they have, to look as grim as they now do, and to produce not only economic downturn, but a political dysfunction uh, that exceeds what I thought. I mean, I, I would have to come up with a stronger phrase than hits the fan, and I thought that was pretty strong yeah. to capture what's going on. I think we are at a very, very bad point. Uh, here we are in an economic system that's in deep trouble, a recovery that left most people out and is even sputtering for the few it benefited now. And we're going to say to the largest single buyer in this country, which is the government, that you should cut back what you buy, cut back what you spend. And all that's going to do is increase the suffering, increase the problems, and provoke in this country uh, a grim recognition that we are heading down and that as we do, the gap between the rich and the poor only gets wider. And this is a set of circumstances that should trouble anyone who's paying attention. So uh, wh what led us to this? Again, this, this, it, it seems to me like the, it, this all began with the, uh, a couple of things. Jude Wininsky's memo in the, in the mid-'70s to the Republicans, his two Santa Claus theory, saying that the, the Democrats had always been Santa Claus. They brought you know, Social Security and unemployment benefits and Medicare and everything else, and everybody loved them, and the Republicans were always Grinches. So they had to flip that upside down. Whenever a Republican president was in office, spend like a drunken sailor, run up the debt as hard and as fast as you can, and then as soon as the Democrat comes in office, scream about the debt and the deficit and use that as a way to force the Democrats to cut the programs, their own programs, so that they will no longer be identified as Santa Claus and the Republicans will be identified as Santa Claus. They've been running that playbook, and some will admit it. I mean, you know, there's numerous columns about this in the conservative publications since the election of Ronald Reagan. And uh, it seems like that is what brought us to this, in my mind. I, I'm curious, your, your take on how we got here. Well, I think that's partly correct. It's clear that the Republicans uh, used this debt ceiling uh, routine as a chance to grandstand. I mean, people should be aware. I counted up, just so I would be able to say things like this on radio and television programs, I counted up the number of times a sitting president has asked for the debt ceiling to be raised or lowered, mostly raised, since 1940. Total number of times, 90, nine zero. More than one and a half times per year on average. It's an absolutely routine thing. Presidents on both parties have asked for it. Representatives of whatever party was out of office grumbled and said, gee, it shows the president's not managing things correctly, and then promptly voted for it until this time when suddenly it became an opportunity to run that game plan that you described with the Republicans taking advantage of people's upset about economic crisis to say, look, we're going to punish the government. That's this strange American idea that when you're fired by a private employer or you're thrown out of your home by a private bank that goes to court, you shouldn't get angry at the employer and you shouldn't get angry at the bank. Instead, you should get angry at the government. They are the root of all evil, and so the Republicans play that game, and they promise that not only will they punish and, and make the government smaller, but they will protect you from taxes. And in a time when nobody trusts politicians anyway, maybe they can win some people who at least think that the chances of a tax will be a little less than it otherwise would be. And the, the Democrats come back, uh, I, would, I would adjust what you said slightly, they come back and say, look, we're the lesser evil, vote for us, because we won't savage Social Security or student loans or all the other things you need as badly as those Republicans will. Uh, this is a sad commentary on where things are, and perhaps the worst part of it for me as a professional economist is that we all know what the fundamental problems are in this economy. We have horrible unemployment. 
We have falling wages. We have benefits being reduced. And that is dragging our economy down. These things all drive down demand. That's right. And they drag the economy down. The president has been saying for three years he's going to stimulate by providing incentives and inducements for the private sector to deal with the unemployment problem. Well, it didn't work under Bush. It has not worked under Obama. Something has to be done. And whatever you may argue, and I have my own preferences for what we ought to do, cutting government spending while doing absolutely nothing else for the unemployment problem will actually make it worse. But maybe that's the Republican strategy that no matter how bad it gets, they can win more votes by positioning themselves as the ones who will punish the nasty government for doing it and who will prevent you from having to pay higher taxes and hope that no one notices that the decreasing condition of the American working class and the mass of the middle class is a direct result of what the Republicans are pushing for. Yeah, I've been saying this since the day that Obama was elected or was, was sworn in the day after when uh, Mitch McConnell said his number one job was to make sure that Obama was a one-term president, that the only way the Republicans could do that would be to obstruct anything that will make the economy better and, in fact, make the economy worse, try to get unemployment up to 10 or 12 percent, try to, if, if possible, maybe even get inflation up. But, but I think it's going to be deflationary. And, and then run on the campaign of, this guy's Herbert Hoover, you need to kick him out. And that they're, they're tr they're, this is a generational play. They're trying, to, they're trying to do what Franklin Roosevelt did, capture an entire generation and, as, as you know, the, the, the saviors of the economy. The problem is that uh, their economic policies are insane. Jude Winiski, in, in addition to coming up with the two Santa Claus theory, was the guy who invented the phrase supply-side economics. Um, tell us how well that's worked out. Yes, it's an unbelievable thing that, that, you know, reasonable, mature men and women still believe that sort of thing. But I guess if you repeat it long enough, the basic idea is the economy is not driven by how many people have jobs and incomes enough to buy the goods and services that we work to produce. No, the argument runs. It goes the other way. We have to do everything possible to provide good profits for businesses, and then if we do that by low taxes, by all kinds of subsidies, by all kinds of deregulation, so they can do whatever it occurs to them will be profitable, why then, by magic, all of this will happen. There's no historical support for this sort of thing. Uh, the conditions that make an economy do well are complicated and many. There's no magic bullet. Uh, we do know that if you throw millions of people out of work, and if you depress the wages and benefits of vast numbers of people, you're not going to boost the overall economic situation in most conditions. Right. That's what we have now, and we're suffering the consequences. Dr. Richard, Professor Richard Wolf, Dr. Richard Wolf is with us. He is the, an economist, a professor of economics emeritus at the University of Massachusetts, currently visiting professor at the New School University in New York City, the author of numerous books, Capitalism Hits the Fan, his most recent, rdwolf.com. We'll be back with your questions for Dr. Wolf. This is the Tom Hartman Program. Stick around. And, we will, and, and Richards, please stick around. We will be right back with your questions for Professor Wolf, and I have a few, few questions as well. We'll be right back. Okay, Professor Wolf, you're still here with us? I certainly am. Great. We have uh, our program. Uh, tell me if you've already been told this. I won't go through the whole thing. Our program is syndicated on commercial stations as well as non-commercial stations and free speech TV. Understood. And our commercial stations just went to break. Our Pacifica stations, coast to coast in Europe and Africa, uh, American Forces Radio all around the world, and Free Speech TV and 55 million homes on Direct TV and Dish Network, they're all still with us. That's the nonprofit feed. So uh, we are still on the air with many of our, much of our audience, maybe even most of our audience. So let's pick up some questions here. Larry in Calamar, Iowa, watching us on Free Speech TV. Larry, you, you have a question for Professor Wolf. You are on the air with him. Yeah, uh, Professor, uh, 10 years ago I'd asked... Uh, an econ pre uh, professor, uh, what what was the outlook for the American economy in 10 years? And at that time, we thought that Gore would win the election, and uh, well, he did. You know, we were under that delusion, but uh, you know, he was 
talking about how we'd reduce the deficit and we would got out of debt and uh, things were going pretty good. Uh, the military force was more of a National Guard where they go in and, you know, take care of things and, uh, you know, natural disasters and such. But uh, what, what do you think 10 years down the road now, what are, what's the American economy going to look like? Are we going to be a third world country and, you know, fighting global warming? In 2021. Else, you know, is yeah. it going to be a mess? Okay. Professor, we've got about two and a half minutes before we rejoin our commercial station for the think, next break. I think it's a, a very good question. I think the prospects are very grim. Ten years ago, think of it this way. Three big things happened to change everything. The first was the massive cutting of taxes on corporations and the rich shortly after Bush took office. The second thing following 9-11 was the commitment of the government having cut its own revenues by freeing up the taxes of rich and corporations to spend an oodle of money on a global war on terror that has us fighting in four different countries right now, costing trillions of dollars. And finally, the third thing was the collapse of our capitalist system in 2007, which then Republicans and Democrats threw untold trillions of dollars into the hands of banks and insurance companies to try to keep it going. You don't need a genius or a PhD to understand that if you cut the revenue of the government massively by tax cuts on rich and corporations while you spend wildly around the world and to bail out a failed system, you're going to plunge the government into a deep budget crisis. No surprise there. It should have been handled differently. It isn't being. And the worst is, facing that deficit of the government caused by those policies, the solution of Democrats and Republicans alike is to cut outlays on old people, sick people, students, and others. It is economic nonsense, but in terms of what I thought were American values, it's unconscionable to boot, and it bodes poorly for the future of this economy, more poorly than any time in my lifetime. Do you think we might be looking at the 1930s repeated here? Yes, I think we're looking now at a double-dip downturn. The signs are all there, specifically over the last month and a half in terms of unemployment, manufacturing production, the housing market, and so on. Yes, we're in bad shape, and we're doing things to make it worse, which we don't need since it's bad enough without the addition of this crazy policy. Absolutely. Senator uh, Professor Robert, uh, Richard Wolf is with us. He is uh, taking your questions. We'll be right back with more Professor Wolf. Stick around. The Tom Hartman program is brought to you in part by Solar World. SolarWorld.com for information on solar electricity. So what you gonna do on Judgment Day? The time to run out now and you can't stay. Welcome back to your Need to Know headquarters, the uh, news headquarters, the Tom Harbin program. Professor Richard Wolf with us, rdwolf with two Fs.com, his website. You can check it out, his most recent book, Capitalism Hits the Fan, the Global Economic Meltdown, and What to Do About It, taking your calls. And, uh, Professor, you're still here with us? I certainly am. Great. Colette in Studio City, California, listening on K-Talk in Los Angeles. You're on the air with, Senator, with uh, excuse me, I'm so used to Senator Sanders, with Professor Wolf. Colette? Oh, Colette vanished. Okay. Lisa in Albuquerque, New Mexico, listening on KABQ. You're on the air with Professor Wolf. Hello, Professor Wolf. Um, I, I had a thought that maybe it's, it's a better idea to focus on our local and state governments, straightening them up, because quite frankly, government, national government is so badly broken and so badly corrupted. Um, all politics is local. And by becoming active within our states and communities, we might be able to change things up the line rather than trying to deal with it directly. It seems politically that's a brilliant strategy. Is it also a good strategy economically, Professor? Well, it would be if the people, like the caller and others, 
in cities, towns, and states across America began to move in large numbers to demand from the local government what it can do and what it should be doing. But whether or not people do that, which I think is the most important question, frankly, what we're facing now is a situation where cities and towns are suffering because of the economic crisis, because of the failure to do anything really about it. Cities and towns are now suffering revenue loss, and that means they have to cut back what they're doing unless they tax the rich and the corporations, which they're afraid to do. So what they've been doing to soften the crisis for them over the last two or three years has been relying on a huge amount of money being given to cities and states by the federal government. And not the least of the tragedies of the deal just struck is that that money is certainly going to be one of the things that gets cut back so that the pressures on cities and states this year, the remaining part of this year, next year, and so on, will actually be worse for the prospects of them offsetting a dysfunctional federal government. You can see that already in places like Central Falls, Rhode Island, a city that has declared bankruptcy and is telling all of its retired police and fire people that their pensions are going to be half starting next month what they have been. You see it wow. in Jefferson County in Alabama. You see it in more and more places that they are in a jam, and I am very frightened that this deal is actually going to make those problems greater, not lesser. Jeff, in Tampa, Florida, listening on WMNF, you are on the air with Professor Richard Wolf. Hi there, Professor Wolf. I, uh, I just was kind of curious if I could get you to elaborate on this. The, uh, the credit rating agencies that have been... It seems like there's question as to their, whether or not they're corrupt agencies to begin with, considering how they also rated, you know, all these, all the, all these uh, shady, uh, shady uh, mortgages and Enron and, and everybody else. Yeah. Yeah. They, exactly. And all the credit, the false swaps, and everything. They rated all those AAA, and it and it seems like their legitimacy should be a lot more in question than it is. Are they just Trying, are they basically just trying to avoid any sort of investigation on their part by threatening to downgrade the U.S. credit rating? Professor Wolf? Well, I think you put your finger on it when you reminded everybody of how badly they did their job in the great crisis that we're now in, how they continuously gave high ratings. And remember what a credit agency is supposed to do. It's supposed to give the investor an unbiased, independent evaluation of how risky every kind of debt instrument, every kind of investment is. And they obviously failed. Everyone knows they failed. And the reason is not far to search. The big banks who produced most of this debt and these pieces of paper were the ones buying the evaluations, and the credit agencies did not want to displease the people they were producing the credit evaluations for. They wanted AAA, so the agency provided it. They're now a little bit in the doghouse and trying to show the world that they're going to be tough-minded because they obviously weren't before. But I think here's the basic problem. We are a debt-ridden society. Our government's in debt, the mass of our people are in debt, corporations are in debt, and out there are lots of creditors, banks, insurance companies, even rich individuals, who are very worried, they don't know where to lend money because they're nervous about the risk. Somebody has to help them, somebody has to evaluate the risk. We use private companies, they have done a horrible job, but because of our ideological blockage in not allowing the government to be in there doing its own evaluations so we at least have some competition from an independent source that isn't the, you know, getting money from the people it evaluates, as long as we don't do that, we really have only ourselves to blame for relying on people who have demonstrated their unreliability. So you mean somebody like the CBO should be competing with Moody's and Standard & Poor in the, in the right. international open market? That's right. And, you know, it's, it's always Makes perfect sense. a little bit... It's a little bit funny to hear the speeches about the wonderfulness of competition from the leaders of these credit agencies, but the work that they do to prevent any real competition from an independent source, which in this case would have to be the government, is, is the real truth behind the Play Act 
uh, of being interested in competition. Remarkable. We j- just have 10 seconds till the break. Uh, Iceland just said no to the banksters. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I think that's a wonderful thing. I think it's a wonderful thing for Americans to think about. The banks, the government told the Icelandic people, you have to pay the cost of all the bad things the bank did. And the people voted 90%. No, we are not. Twice they voted it. That's yeah. right. It's an amazing <laughs> show of what people can do if they get together and they focus on who the problem really is. There you go. And, and meanwhile, now Spain and Italy are struggling because they are actually paying back the banksters. Professor Richard Wolf is with us. R.D. Wolf. And Professor Wolf, you're still here. I certainly am. Okay, let's pick up some more calls for you. Here is, uh, actually, b- before we do, if a point of privilege, if I may ask you a question. This morning on Joe Scarborough's show, do you have this clip, Jacob? I, I want to play a, a, just a little bit of audio for you. This, is, this was on MSNBC this morning, so it's like the whole country was getting this meme. And this is the meme that I think that the Republicans are really going to be pushing. Here's Joe Scarborough this morning. I would argue, because tax cuts are Keynesian, I would argue nobody since FDR, or maybe LBJ, has been as, as, as pro-Keynesian as Bush. Think about it. Two wars. Yeah. Massive, the, the massive domestic spending, massive tax cuts, a seven trillion dollar Medicare drug benefit plan. Now, this is not supply side <laughs> economics. Bush, George W. Bush, was the most reckless Keynesian spender, at least since LBJ. I would argue, you could go back, take reckless out since FDR. Look, we've I- had a decade of Keynesian economics, and it has led us here. Look. Now, Mr. Uh, Professor Wolf, I, yeah, I've read the writings of John Maynard Keynes, and. And I don't recall his saying the tax cuts was a was a stimulus, and 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 I do recall uh, his writing or or perhaps peripheral writing suggesting that war is the least efficient way to stimulate an economy because when you build a bomb, yes, you do put some people to work, but that bomb gets dropped and doesn't produce any enduring value. Um, is Joe Scarborough right or is he nuts? No, he's he's just basically. Uh, trying to attack what has been going on in the interests of a kind of Tea Party logic. So, for example, it is not Keynesian economics to cut taxes uh, on the rich and corporations. First of all, on the rich. What rich people do when you cut their taxes, they don't spend that money because they already spend what they need. So they tend to save it which is a terrible thing for the economy. You can see it now. Corporations and wealthy people have huge amounts of money, but they're not investing it. They're not creating jobs. The irony is they're lending it to the government because the government has to borrow since it didn't tax the right. corporations. So, so the, the bottom rate. line here is that, that the, the economic policies practiced by George W. Bush were in virtually no way Keynesian and these guys are trying to smear the idea of Keynesian economics so that there will never again be a stimulus from the federal government. Um, it, you know, and they're, they're trying to do this politically. And I'm just astounded that there was an economist on the show this morning who let uh, Joe Scarborough get away with this. Yeah, well, you know, in the hysteria, there is now no limit to what people will say. Yeah. Somehow a government that deregulates is doing a wonderful thing, even though we know that the crisis we're in now is in major way a result of all that deregulation. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's uh, extraordinary to hear this kind of logic. Yeah, it, it absolutely is. Okay, let's pick up our fo- uh, callers. We've got a solid board here. Frank in Cambridge, Mass. You're on the air with uh, Professor Wolf. Oh, thank you very much for taking the call. Uh, and thank you, Professor Wolf. It's a privilege uh, talking to you. But I saw your presentation at Smith College in 2008, November 2008. And in the fifth section, you talked about a new idea for capitalism, which, uh, and then a few days ago, I saw you on an interview, and you talked about this, uh, you sort of referred to this, uh, a new approach to capitalism, that this type of, this, and as a matter of fact, like FDR, in effect, in effect save capitalism from the capitalists. And I think I'd like to know further what you, what you were talking about in part five of your presentation, which you use the model of the uh, Silicon Valley, and what you see that as the future. How, 
can we uh, get out of this mess? Thank you, Frank. Professor? I think you have to go to the root of the problem, which is something, you know, you really can't avoid anymore when the problems are as severe and as long-lasting as the ones we're in. The root of the problem for me is the way we organize business. The ma vast majority of us come to work Monday through Friday, 8 o'clock, stay till 5, do a lot of work, then we leave and go home. All the decisions about what happens on the job, what we produce, how we produce, what's done with the profits our work produces, is all decided by a tiny group of people called a board of directors who are in their position because of another tiny group of people, the major shareholders. They use those profits to shape our politics, see what we have. They use those profits to move production abroad, if they can make even more profits that way. They use that position they have in society to produce the results we have. Bad results if the government regulates them, bad results if the government doesn't. And I think we have to understand that if we don't change that, if we don't democratize our enterprises, all the rest of our programs, all the rest of our hopes will be as smashed as our economy now is. To say it in the simplest language, we believe in democracy. And it shouldn't stop this democracy in our communities. It should extend when we cross the threshold into where we work. A democracy at work where the people themselves decide what to produce, how to produce, and what to do with the profits gives us a much better hope for a reasonable economic system that works for all of us rather than the economic system that is showing us that if you leave businesses organized the way they are now, the economy will serve them the shareholders, the boards of directors, the top executives. And if that means at the expense of everybody else, so be it. And I don't think we'll change that if we are not willing to ask the question, does this capitalist arrangement we've been in now need to be questioned? You know, we should have been debating this for the last 50 years. Lazy fair capitalism. But, yeah, you know, can we do better than capitalism? It's a question we should ask about all of our institutions. Sure. Not just the government, but our economic system. If it produces economic crisis after crisis, if it produces a, a dysfunctional government, these are hints, let us say, that we ought to stop being afraid of debating this question and begin to do what we should have done for 50 years and see whether we can do better because our people need it and the danger of not doing it is becoming unbearable. Dave in Ohio, you're on the air with Professor Wolf. Yeah, Tom, thank you, and uh, thank you, Professor. Well, um, remember Alan Greenspan kept saying, don't worry about the deficit, it's very manageable. Well, I think it was 2006 or seven. he was in Europe, and he was caught on mic saying, that's our biggest problem. Well, then he comes back and says, oh, don't worry about it. Now, a few months ago, he was on and said my ideology was wrong. And I think that was just telling him, you can't arrest me. My ideology was wrong. <laughs> you know, there's nothing legal you can do. But uh, Greenspan was a major part of this problem. So, Professor Wolf, your thoughts? Yes, you know, uh, Greenspan certainly was. He engineered an enormous increase in the money supply in the United States. He was the guy who brought down the interest rates fast and dramatically uh, after the economic downturn early in the year 2000. That lower interest rate produced this, the boom in real estate and in all of those transactions that we now know were shady and blew up in our faces in 2006 and seven. Uh, but we do not punish people like that. We punish some e abstraction called the big bad government. But we don't publish the, uh, the punish the people who actually do it. And you know, to be fair to Mr. Greenspan, he at least has had the minimum decency of saying that he was wrong. Mr. Scarborough and folks like that, they never learn anything. They keep believing what they need to believe to make their political points, no matter what happens. Mr. Greenspan at least has been saying that they were wrong, they made mistakes. And by the way, we should pay attention to one particular thing he said. He said that he counted on the private sector, private capitalist enterprise and finance, to be an efficient organization for progress. And he said that was wrong. Now that's a lesson the American people ought to listen to. 
The culprit in this situation is not the government, although Lord knows they make lots of mistakes. But you can trace most of the mistakes they made to the very influence of the private sector they're supposed to regulate. They look the other way because that's what pays their bills. And if we don't change that at the base, we're simply fiddling while Rome burns, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. Just a, a very quick question. We've got 20 or 30 seconds before the next break. Um, is it possible, is there an alternative to growing our way out of this? Yeah, growth is not available for us. You know, that hope that somehow we can blow every problem out of the water by growing so fast. The way Eisenhower did. Right. Though, that even though we give more and more to the rich at the expense of the poor, the standard of living of the poor in the middle will rise because the whole ocean is rising, the whole output is rising. Our output isn't rising. Our output is going absolutely nowhere. We have moved production out of the United States. We've moved white-collar work now out of the United States. Growth isn't available, and that's why the prospects if you don't change fundamentally, look as bad as they now do. Yeah. Professor Richard Wolf is with us, uh, rdwolf.com. His website, check it out. He's the author of numerous books, including Capitalism Hits the Fan. We'll be right back with more of Professor Wolf. You're listening to the Tom Hartman Program. Visit tomhartman.com for audio and video archives. Check out rdwolf.com to see Professor Wolf's website and information about him and his books. We'll be right back. And Professor Wolf, you're still with us? I am, okay. although I do believe that we were going to do this for 45 minutes. Right. Do you, do you need to go now, or can I, you stay? I'm afraid I do. I have another TV appointment, okay. and I needed 15 minutes to get across Manhattan to be there. I understand. Okay. In that case, thank you so much for being with us today, You're very sir. welcome, and let me tell you how important what you're doing is to give another dimension to the public debate in this country. I don't know what would happen if there weren't folks like you doing this, so my hat's off to you. Well, thank you so much, Professor, and, and I uh, back at you. Uh, okay. You're doing great work. Thank uh, you very much. Take you're, care. You're welcome. Thank you. Professor Richard Wolf.